Welcome to The Playbook. I am so excited because we have a huge guest, my friend, Sikinder Singh Cassidy. And I say my friend because I can actually pronounce her name correctly. She is the founder of Boardlist, uh, ex-president, I believe, of a company I used to work a lot mm -hmm. with, which is StubHub. Correct. And spend a lot of money with, by the way. Mm -hmm. And too. more importantly, I'm so excited because you've written your first book. It comes out August 17th, Choose Possibility. Yes. Thank and you I've, for having me. Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited. So... I want to just get to the part about possibility. I'm looking at your career. Mm -hmm. You're someone who I should make the poster child. I do a lot within financial literacy. Mm -hmm. You were able to balance your checkbook before you were 10. <laughs> yes. You obviously grew up in a realm or a perspective or a mindset that anything was going to be possible in your life. Mm -hmm. Although ex on the exterior, mm -hmm. uh, being the age that you are mm -hmm. and the gender that you are, you know, most people probably wouldn't have told you anything's possible in your life, Sikinder. Mm -hmm. Where did that come from and how have you evolved choosing possibility and what did that mean to you throughout that evolution? Uh, well, first of all, you're right that I did grow up believing everything was possible. But, you know, let's let's attack that for a moment because I grew up in a family of two doctors. So people were like, <laughs> OK, doctors, Indian, you know, anything was possible if, after med school. Yeah, is that exactly. what I should have said? There was a little bit of like, are you sure you don't want to be a doctor? <laughs> but but I would tell you that my father loved running a business. He saw I mean, it's like I think what I saw modeled at home was somebody who loved being an entrepreneur. You know that entrepreneurs often grow from entrepreneurial families, somebody who loves serving people and medicine was both his vocation, right? And his purpose. So I saw somebody who sort of lived their purpose every day, which was really meaningful. Um, I grew up pretty solidly middle class, so I never like wanted for, you know, clothes, right? I, I, I always say to people like, you understand possibility was possible because I was very secure. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, but I also grew up with one really important element, which is why I wrote the book actually that possibility is not just in big acts, it's in small acts, right? So people are like, well, you know, we tend to think of possibility and risk taking as like you have to make a gigantic choice or no choice. And to your point, you're like, well, you you could bounce your checkbook at 10. I'm like, that's because my dad had me doing his books, right? And you'd say, <laughs> okay, well, what's exciting about doing your father's books if he runs a medical practice? But you sort of see that entrepreneurship is not like something that's so mysterious, right? It's literally as simple as like, here are the revenues, here are my costs, it needs to balance. And so I would say to people like possibility is in, you know, choosing to take a small risk and, you know, expand your services or in the case of my dad, like buying a building and deciding he wanted to have a walk-in clinic, right? But like, there was like possibility was small and incremental. It wasn't just this gigantic thing. And so that is, that has been my worldview. And I always say to people like, if you ask what I think, when I think about possibility, what do I think? I think possibility is the ability to make a choice on any given day that is incrementally better than today. And I agree with that. The interesting thing though is there had to be some pressure. So mm -hmm. I grew up with nothing, mm -hmm. single mom, probably the same mottos in my house, doctor, mm -hmm. lawyer, or failure, yes, yes. Um, without the entrepreneurial side. So my mom, yes. fear-based, mm -hmm. was don't take risks. In fact, mm -hmm. when I graduated law school and had a job as a oil and gas litigator or work in the internet in mm -hmm. 1999, she said, without a doubt, the internet's a fad. Mm -hmm. Don't go you know, into Silicon Valley, don't do this. And you know, I realized that she was, in her mind, protecting me, mm -hmm. um, but for you, you know, I always said my possibility started with I had a necessity for possibilities. Yes. Now you take the reverse saying everything's possible because I was secure. Yes. I said everything was possible because what did I have to lose? Well, you're hitting you're hitting, I think, a really key construct. First of all, um, and I talk about this um, when people talk about reasons to take risk. We always think that, you know, reasons to take risk are for the upside. That's true. You you just identified one other reason people take risks when there is like the opportunity for like you to be harmed further or to be in crisis, people surprisingly are the most agile, right? Like when you have nothing to lose. Like in COVID. Yes, COVID saw a lot is a of people perfect respond, example, right? Mm -hmm. right? I also say like people think COVID taught us to be risk averse and I'd be like, well, COVID taught us that we are far more agile than we think, that we are capable to res of responding. And weirdly, people took more risk in COVID than they did in the upside. I know at StubHub, right. my team became more risk taking in order to avoid going out of business than they were in the previous two years when all we had to play for was upside. So you're right, it can come from either place. I think that I think that's one of the things that's a fallacy, right? That we need to um, find reasons to take risk. There are reasons to take risk every day, whether it's to avoid harm or whether it's to, you know, as we talked about, embrace some new possibility that you're dreaming about, but just can't get there because you're too scared. And through that, a lot of people 
that achieve success from taking risks mm -hmm. will continue to take risks. Mm -hmm. I was one of them. I lost yes. over a hundred million dollars, went bankrupt in 2008 mm -hmm. because I was confident now that I could just make it myself. Mm -hmm. Where does confidence play a role? True confidence, not because my parents had money or my yeah. both my parents are doctors, but I see a lot of people that choose possibilities or just simply they find it within themselves that everything's possible. How does that take, play a role? The confidence. Well, well, you're hitting the thing that I think we all underestimate. We think that confidence comes from success. Confidence comes from agility. Like you just hit it, right? So you and I have both had failures in our career. I've had failures too. Like, you know, some <laughs> big, some small. Um, but I think that we think the feedback loop is I make a great choice. That's a choice. Choice is binary. I succeed or I fail. And I gain confidence if I succeed. And I'm like, well, what if I make a choice? I may fail or succeed, but more likely I got to make another choice and then another choice and then another choice. And between now and any ultimate reward might be a big failure or not, right? And I've probably made a hundred choices by the time I get to that reward. But along the way, every choice I make that I get feedback from, I become more agile. And once I know I can respond to anything, I become more confident. So I bet you, you were more confident weirdly after the hundred million dollar failure because your sense that you could literally respond to any circumstance is quite high. So is mine. And within that context of agility, adaptability uh, is what I think a mindset of seeking the lesson. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest shifts in the paradigm of my life is detaching my emotions from this outcome of once I graduate law school, I'll be happy. Once I get married, once I have kids, you know, once I own this. Mm -hmm. And then it turned into after my bankruptcy, you know, I love this continuum of choices because yes. I've never thought of that, but I have utilized the continuum of okay. lessons. Yes. Yeah. And lessons and choices are very similar, right? Because you said like, they're like the shadow of each other. Cause if you say I'm I have a lesson, that lesson is a feedback loop that informs the next choice, right? So you only get to make the next choice if you have the lesson from the last choice. Yeah. But people think there's only one choice and what you and I know is like, there's not one choice. There's like a hundred or a thousand variables and iterations here. So if you can take the lesson from the last choice, you now are better informed in the next choice. But you're right, it's, I mean, I say that as if it's so wise. I mean, <laughs> it is though. Some of the simplest things are the wisest uh, maybe, things. Maybe, but you have to like, you know what I mean? You, you go through the painful like, feedback loop of failure yourself in order to get there. Right, well, if we only would listen to ourselves more often. Um, within the context of that though, uh, learning lessons, we have choices and people make the mistake of thinking there's a right choice mm -hmm. or a wrong choice. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that in the book? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it's a great point. I think that there is a calculated choice and a non-calculated choice. Does that make sense? So I say like there is no wrong or right choice, but there are things you can do to improve your probabilities. And, I'm, and I, I wish the world would become calculated risk takers. You know, when you think it's binary, then you actually are far more likely to make a rash risk. So to me, the only kind of wrong choice is when you fail to choose, right? You have choices and you fail to choose. Or number two, you know, you're so, you feel, have so much pressure to choose that you make a rash decision, as opposed to saying like, hey, I'm gonna look at all the variables. I'm gonna make a decision, take a calculated risk, and then I know if it's calculated, I can feel good about what my thesis was. So I think risks without theses are kind of stupid, you know? Right, or risks without values. I think yes. time is a, another variable within choice right. that is so interesting to me. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, I think I do a lot of coaching as you do in mentoring. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I tell people, they'll ask me, should I invest in real estate? Should I invest yeah. in crypto? Should I? I said, what's your timing and risk tolerance? Yes. Right, because now you can make a calculated. Yes, you can make a calculated. A calculated choice. right, and right. there's so many times that people don't know their personal values yeah. or their experiential values. Mm -hmm. They're giving values or receiving values, but yet they wonder, Dave, how do you make such quick decisions? Yes, because they're not rash decisions anymore. In fact, yes. a lot of uh, the decisions that I made that were ego-based conscious decisions. Yeah. I overanalyzed, mm -hmm. ended up bankrupt. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't a matter of analyzing in time. Mm -hmm. It was the matter of I didn't understand my timing and risk tolerance and I didn't vet mm -hmm. powerfully, which I have learned this great saying, trust and vet. Yes. Don't yes. just trust. Yeah, trust and vet. I think <laughs> just because you analyze something doesn't mean you tr you vetted it. Yeah, yeah, that's right? a very it's fair a point. Hard questions yeah. uh, are how you vet something. So how does time play a role in decision making? Well, I think you, you uh, by the way, I love that trust in that. I just have to say that's, that that to me makes so much sense and I've just never heard it put that way. So I think time actually has two dimensions in our risk-taking choices. Number one is you identified, like 
you have to have a horizon, right? So if you said make a decision without a horizon, I'm like, for me, I think in three to five year horizons, because I have a really hard time imagining what life looks like beyond three to five years. Like fundamentally hard. There's so many variables, right? So when people want to take these very long time horizons in their decisions, I'm like, okay, you need to understand that, you know, in the time where you think the life, life is staying static, like everything is changing. So sometimes I'm like, maybe shorten your window, then you don't feel so boxed in in making a decision. If you think you're making a decision for 10 years or a lifetime, you just may never decide, right? <laughs> so sometimes I'm like narrow those because like this fan of volatility decreases with time. So, you know, maybe three or five years is enough to have some certainty on what you want, but not to be boxed in for the rest of your life. So that's, I think one dimension is like, how do you think about those time windows? The second one though, is almost the opposite and you hit it. Time is also your enemy, right? When we think about stasis, which is making no decisions, people sometimes think that the environment will stay the same. You and I both know the biggest variable often isn't you, it's what's happening in your environment. And so when people wanna make no decision, over, I feel like they're really counting on time standing still. And that never happens. So in some ways I'm like shorten your own framework for making a decision and understand that there's volatility all around you. So if you think conditions today are gonna be the same tomorrow, they're not. So there is a cost to not making a decision far more than to making the wrong decision and getting the feedback. So smart. And I take this three steps and I told you I'd ask a question at least that hopefully no one has ever asked you about making decisions. Mm -hmm. I believe, you know, in decision making, number one, we have to know where we are. I tell myself mm -hmm. I'm at the right way at the perfect time, kind of take yeah. inventory of our values, yes. time and risk tolerance. Then you have to have this cho choosing possibility attitude mm -hmm. of I'm angling towards what I want, yes. which is the continuum of choices. Yes. But I believe beyond time and all this, that faith mm -hmm. plays a role. Mm -hmm. Disregard religion, please. Yes. I'm talking about this faith yep. that I have that when I make a decision, mm -hmm because of who I am and what I believe and what I'm willing to do, think, say, do, and believe, and knowing my quantum nature, that I'll end up in a, I have faith mm -hmm. that even if the circumstance of that choice ends up to be a setback of failure, mistake, et cetera, that it's because I'm gonna end up in a better place. Mm -hmm. How important is that perspective of faith in choosing? Um, well, first of all, I know you said don't go to religion, but I'm going to go can. there for just a I moment. I said I wasn't going yes, to religion. You, you go wherever I, the hell so you I, want. I, I, so I was raised quite religious, right? <laughs> Me religious, too, by the way. Yes, religious <laughs> in the sense, and, and though I, I'm, I'm a practicing Sikh, um, but my father, my father my, and my mother just prayed every day, believe in a higher power, and so do I. So first and foremost, you have to understand, I was raised with the idea that there is faith, and I've always thought that whether you are religious or not, the role of faith is when times are tough, they give you a way to cope. Um, and then to your point, they give you a belief system when times are tough too. So I actually do believe in faith as a religion, but let's just put yeah. that aside for a moment. Is there, or like that's a foundation and yep. a benefit of having religion. But let's just step back. To your point, remember we talked about the thing called confidence. I'm like confidence and faith to me are like sisters because I think once you have lived through and responded to a set of experiences, regardless of how they turn out, you have two things that you that hold you stable, right? One is confidence in your future ability to respond. And number two is you, once you've lived two or three cycles, you do see that things happen for a reason, right? And so I have, I think I was given by my family, but I think through my own set of, sort of living choices and the results, I kind of do have this fundamental feeling that you know, business is gonna be my way of giving to the world, that my vocation and my purpose are the same thing. And so as long as I'm making choices that are congruent with who I am and what I believe, I have confidence in my ability to respond, whether it's poor or right, I know that I'll respond in a way that is consistent with who I am, and that that will take me to a place that ultimately has value. You're right, that ultimately has, at a, at a minimum, has impact. And I sort of feel like my North Star is aim for impact. You will end up where you're meant to be. It's not all in your control. But what is in your control should be congruent with who you are and your values. Yeah, and doing your best, right? And the doing desire your best, absolutely. That you must be what you can be, which has been, as far as I can tell by doing research, indicative mm -hmm. in your life before even you were 10, mm -hmm. that you had a desire that you must be what you can be. Yeah. Speaking of which, not only do you have a desire that you must be what you can be, mm -hmm. you also subscribe to the same philosophy I do of elevating others to have the desire and to perform in that enjoyment of the consistent, everyday, persistent, without quit, pursuit of their own potential. Mm -hmm. And board list to me represents mm -hmm. exactly that. Mm -hmm. And being someone who sits on a lot of boards, mm -hmm. someone who uh, is always pushing mm -hmm. for equal representation on boards for multiple reasons, mm -hmm. there's a pragmatic 
uh, deterrent of putting equal equity on boards mm -hmm. and there's reality of shareholder interest and relationship capital and all of these other things. What can we do mm -hmm. in order to help reduce the natural socioeconomic stresses that are put on boards? Mm -hmm. Uh, and this is that blend yes. that we are dealing with today, mm -hmm. uh, our, our generation, you yes. and I closer in age. What can we do to open minds mm -hmm. that yes, mm -hmm. there will be an economics, you know, uh, sacrifice or diminished capacity in the short term, mm -hmm. but in the long term, we are all going to benefit not just economically, mm -hmm. but in a higher sense of elevating equity and really having a shared open collective consciousness, I call it, which yep. is much more valuable yes. than having some old middle-aged white <laughs> guy that is connected to a ton of money. And literally, that's yes. why people will ask, I mean, I hope they admire some of my intelligence yes. and experience, but look, I know I know a lot of people with money and mm -hmm. that attracts boards mm -hmm. yeah. for, for me. Well, I think you you hit on a few different themes, so let me, let me come back sure. in a while. Number one, Today, it's true that possibility, even though we can, you and I can both say possibility is abundant in this world, and we can both agree that it's inequitably distributed, right? Yep. So you can, you can both believe both to be true, that there's a lot of possibility, but that if you try to access it, some people can access it equally, in, including in boardrooms. You hit on another topic, which is relationship capital. It is true that once your networks are homogeneous, opportunity passes homogeneously, right? So platforms like the board, board list are trying to open up those networks. There's um, one third thing you said that I want to just hit on, it turns out that diversity is not just good over the long term. From a shareholder returns perspective, it is a proven actually, you know, um, pr creates premium return on equity even over the short term. So the irony in all of this is if, if you actually wanted to increase wealth, you would put diversity on your board yesterday. And it wouldn't just be because somebody is a different color or a different race. It would be because quite frankly, I can bet that just about any company you have is also being disrupted. If it's not being disrupted by COVID, it's being disrupted by technology. If it's not disrupted by technology, it's disrupted by a Gen Z customer. If it's not disrupted by Gen Z customer, it's just disrupted by, you know, political and societal wins. Like every single one's disrupted. And so I think that the problem with boards today is the reason they're going to decrease in shareholder value is because they have stale talent on their boards, right? So. I think that this idea that you have to trade off the short term for the long term is actually one that is a you know one that we need to actively refute. But I think what you would do to get people there is say like, okay, like every part of your business is being disrupted. So I'm not quite sure why it makes sense to keep the same person in your board seat, the same five people in your board seat for like 20 years when you really should be doing is changing out that talent alongside the conditions of your business. And to that, creating a business around that mm -hmm. now brings in another layer. Now, you've been extremely successful, especially recently mm -hmm. on the business side of things. In case yeah. I didn't mention it, you know, you had a big exit in 2020 of all years, mm -hmm. over $4 billion, I believe. Yeah, uh, selling StubHub. Yeah. And selling StubHub, uh, which is an extraordinary, I would call it milestone mm -hmm. uh, as a female executive, especially. I have three daughters and mm -hmm. I'm always pointing out milestones and they get mad at me <laughs> uh, i named my my son miles for a reason i love it well because warren moon my business mm -hmm. partner for example i believe he's a milestone mm -hmm. and a milestone person like uh you know roberto clemente who we mm -hmm. represented or jackie robinson it allows people to see mm -hmm. where they can go past mm -hmm. not what they can be yeah, yeah and i think it's a difference how does that play a role the milestone mm -hmm. perspective in board list um, well, I think, uh, I think a couple of things. So first of all, I think that you identify that people want to see that something is possible by seeing visible examples of it, right? So, you know, yes, you can say me with StubHub, but you can also say, hey, when you walk into a boardroom and see that three people are, you know, are there at the table and are visibly different, it makes you think that you can be too. If you're a customer and you subscribe to a company and you say, wow, that board looks like me, you think like maybe this is a place I belong. And so I think ultimately the milestones that are created every time you put a female or a person of color in a, on a boardroom or in a position of leadership, it doesn't matter what it is, is it's creating an example, not just for your employees, but for your customers, you know, for the entire ecosystem around your business, your vendors, what have you, to understand that there's a possibility of inclusion for everyone. Um, and I think that's pretty powerful as a milestone. So I love every individual milestone the board list creates when we have the first of some person or some different representation in a boardroom. But more importantly, I guess I just love collectively what it signals, you know, to uh, the entire ecosystem around that company. And last question, there's this reality that exists that it takes time mm -hmm. because of the homogeneity, 
in, yes. and include and I know we were talking mm -hmm. we both do work with female quotient yes of how much time will it take even if we push yeah uh, and I've been again. working you know my career mm -hmm. for example that I want in, in the sports realm mm -hmm. I, I would like the day to come where they just say quarterback mm -hmm. there's no special thing that is a mm -hmm. black quarterback and yes. we actually in my lifetime almost are there yeah almost They're very yeah, very happening. rarely yeah. very most of the time it's like he's just an idiot yeah. and i like that better <laughs> yeah. or he has a weak arm <laughs> yeah, you know yeah. that's fine yeah, yeah but you like that that's what's called yeah, that, right? and, yeah. And, and you know when will we see that type of inclusion in the c-level suites mm -hmm. and boards mm -hmm. you know is it multiple lifetimes or things are moving quicker with technology, w will it come quicker than multiple lifetimes? I think it will take two pushes. Number one, uh, the reality is the pace of disruption of businesses is going to for force a turnover quicker than we think. And then number two, let's be clear, like everybody piling on in the ecosystem, California legislature, NASDAQ, Goldman Sachs, you know, people literally, you know, multiple institutional investors like BlackRock or others saying like, hey, you know what, we're looking to see what the, what the, um, makeup is of right. your boards. I think, by the way, exec teams aren't there yet, but it's coming where there's going to be a day where they ask for those numbers too. So I think it actually takes a multifaceted push for it to be, let's call it not multiple generations. And I think that's what people point to when they do the linear math. They're like, well, if you continue at the current pace, it's going to be like blah, blah, <laughs> blah. And I'm like, but the pace is accelerating. This right. is like a, you know, this is like a boulder rolling downhill and gaining momentum. And that's a good thing. Uh, and I think that moment, momentum will continue, but you need it from all sides. And more importantly, the need from all sides, we need to have the right mindset, mm -hmm. heart set, and this conscious continuum that we discuss. And I think that's what your book to me really represents is that triad of mm -hmm. having the right mindset, heart set, and here's some pragmatic ways mm -hmm. that we can utilize choice and mm -hmm. possibilities to accelerate our own lives or elevate our own lives mm -hmm. to a greater good, a collective mm -hmm. consciousness. And that book comes out August 17th. It's called Correct. Choose Possibility. Such a pleasure to be here with Sakinder Singh Cassidy, founder of Boardlist and of course, author of the incredible book, Choose Possibilities. August 17th, grab a copy.